What is happening, everybody, and welcome to MLB Live Before Lock. Myself and Matt Bellman are going to be breaking down what is a, a full MLB slate and also the return of my favorite MLB GPP. We've got the $3.150 max back on DraftKings. So if people are looking to 150 max enter a tournament, it does give you a, a little bit of a cheaper option to be able to do it. And so I'm really excited. It is a tournament that I like playing in a whole bunch. So uh, I'm excited for that. If you guys are watching here, which I assume you are because you're here listening to me, like the video. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. That is very much appreciated. Matt, you and I did a basketball show together earlier. A lot happened. I experienced an earthquake on the middle of the show. And now it's time to talk about baseball. What's happening, Matt? Nothing. Just happy you're still here with us after that traumatic experience. <laughs> I still can't believe it. Um, just glad you're safe, though. Um, glad there was no significant damage as you were talking and telling me before the show. Yeah, it wasn't uh it wasn't like a insanely high earthquake, but yeah, Sotex. We had a uh it was a, a four point eight earthquake that the epicenter was right by my house. It was uh, a town very close over, so fifteen miles from me. So yeah, we're doing the NBA strategy show this morning and all of a sudden everything started uh shaking and it was something I'd never experienced before. And now I know you have to be safe at all times, Matt, because you don't know what could happen at any point in time. So Ideally, I would start wearing a helmet inside, but I don't have any helmets. But don't worry, guys. Still being safe. I've got two condoms on. I assume that could protect me from a number of potential issues that could arise from earthquakes. So I'm set. I'm ready to go. I'm safe. You ready to talk about some baseball, Matt? I am. I just have to, again, commend you on how cool, calm, and collected you were. That is not me. You can ask my wife. I would not <laughs> be that guy. That's cool, calm, and collected. So I can really appreciate that. I mean, it was a freaking earthquake. And you're just like, yeah. It's an earthquake. So again, I don't know because I've never experienced it, but I have to imagine I would be freaking out just a little bit more. So I commend you. So what would you, if if the roles were reversed, like are you diving under your desk? Are you leaving the office? What what would you be doing? I don't know because I've never like felt what an earthquake is like. So like, I don't know. It's just, it was, it, so my experience is just everything shakes a lot. And I assume at first you're just kind of confused. Most people I know I was maybe people get used to it and they're just identify right away as like, oh, this is an earthquake. But the first few seconds, I'm like, I have no clue what it is that's uh, that's going on right here. And then once I figured it out, it's like, oh, I just wait for it to stop shaking and then we're good. Hopefully the house doesn't fall. If it does, I'm kind of fucked anyway. So like what what uh, what difference that's fair. at that point? So the truth is, if the roles were reversed and we were doing a show, I would show off like I was cool, calm and collected. But inside, I would be freaking out. And I don't know. That's not all I can say. So maybe that was you, but I don't see it. I feel like that was just, you were like, it is what it is. Like, I'm just going to talk about Malzinha Pereira and move on with my day. Yeah, it's uh, part of it is it is what it is. And then it's also like, oh, my God, how do I make a joke about this? I need to I need to make a joke about this scenario. <laughs> and then eventually I found it because you're like, what do you do in this scenario? I was like, I just don't die. And then once I'm able to get a joke at, it's like, all right, cool. We're back on track. That's funny. That's great. So, yeah. It's all good. Uh, by the way, Eric calling me a complete baby. I don't know how I'm a baby. I didn't really, I just sat here. I finished the show. I didn't, I didn't leave. There was some minor damages around my house. I didn't complaining about it or anything though. Had a light fall and break, had some cracked drywall, but yeah, we're, we're, we're trialing. I, I've, I've done a gazillion shows today. MMA show. That's going to be going up soon. We got the NBA post-lock show in a little bit and now of course MLB live before lock as well and where I want to start is as per usual here Matt we're going to talk about the uh, pay up pitching options and also uh, we are sponsored here by DraftKings Pick 6 we're talking a little bit more about them as we go here and there's a pay up option who's clearly in the tier of his own Matt if you're paying up all the way today Spencer Strider is $11,000 on DraftKings he is uh, 10,800 over on FanDuel so we'll talk about them a little bit differently as far as DraftKings and FanDuel are concerned because the ownership is so different. But what do you do with Spencer Strider on DraftKings? He's got by a mile our highest top two pitcher odds. He is projected for 31.5% ownership, but still we do him with a 32.8% chance to be the top scoring pitcher. Spencer Strider, for my money, I believe is the best pitcher we have in baseball right now. But how are you going to approach him for tonight's DFS slate? Play him. Like he's always the best option on any slate he's on. It's not a great matchup. Like Arizona is a good lineup. They've proven it to start the season. They were in the World Series last year, but Spencer Strider. So he's the top option. There are other good pitching options today. So I don't think it's like 
Scooble today where he looks so much better than everyone else, but he's the top guy. I don't think there's any question about it. And then kind of related to that too, if you guys are playing in cash games, click on Spencer Strider. It's going to be the easy decision that you will make in a cash game today. So uh, Strider for tournaments, good option to get to. I, I don't think I'm going to be all that much different than the field though. I find it to be pretty difficult to get to like 50% of him at his price point at $11,000, but I expect they'll be somewhere around the field, having about a third of my lineups. He is going to be my most rostered pitcher on the slate and a guy that I like getting to a good amount. Matchup against the Arizona Diamondbacks, not the easiest one in the world, but Spencer Strider, I think he's going to prove to be pretty matchup proof this season, as he has been in other years as well. Because even if he does get into a spot where he gives up two, three runs, there are so many strikeouts that come with Spencer Strider that he just generally ends up putting up big fantasy scores no matter what. So Spencer Strider, very important play on DraftKings. What do you make of him on FanDuel, though? Because on FanDuel, where he's 10,800, he is projected for sub-10% ownership. And where you're only able to roster one pitcher, do you think he'd still be the guy that you gravitate toward, that you gravitate towards the most over on FanDuel at 10-8 as the only pitcher to roster? I do. He's still the top guy. Again, not a must because of how expensive he is, and it caps you offensively. But he is the top pitcher on any slate he's on. Tonight's no different. I'll throw this question back to you. But I'll also add in, it makes sense that you're getting to about the field on Strider on DK and like 150. In single entry, though, are you playing him? Yeah, so I assume the answer is yes. I don't know because I haven't built out my single entry lineup sure. yet, but most likely scenario is I will end up playing Spencer Strider in single entry. Then the other part of that becomes like, all right, what, what reasonably priced pitcher, reasonably priced stack are we going to get with them? That's something I always like about this show, whether I'm doing it with you or – Eric or whoever else I'm doing it with is this show often becomes a process for me to kind of walk through the tools, look at what I've simmed out and then figure out from there what it is that I really want to be rostering for the slate with the makeup of it. So uh, that is something that I think we're going to find out as we go here, particularly when we get into stacks, because whether I do or don't play Spencer Strider in single entry is going to be largely dependent on what is the pricing of the stack that we like getting to. I uh, couldn't agree more. So let's talk about the other pay up options on the slate and if you are not going to be paying up for Spencer Strider and not, not saying like overall, but in the individual lineup where maybe you don't have Spencer Strider, Logan Gilbert is 9,600. Freddie Peralta is 9,300. Aaron Nola is 9,000. Of these 9K options, these guys priced in the 9K range, which one would you most want to get to in a lineup that doesn't have Spencer Strider? It's a good question. I think any of them is a reasonable answer. For me, I'm going to play the ownership game and say Logan Gilbert was phenomenal in his first start against Boston. He's showing up as the highest leverage pitcher on the slate. I don't think you need to do that, but if you like a popular stack, there's certainly worse plays you could make. So I'm going to say Gilbert, and I also like Peralta a lot, both pitchers in that game. I like Peralta a lot. The problem, though, is just the ownership. I cannot believe how popular he is on both DraftKings and FanDuel, where Logan Gilbert projected for, uh, sorry, uh, Freddie Peralta projected for 36.5% ownership. Andre, he's even more popular than Spencer Strider is today. Over on FanDuel, Freddie Peralta projected for 24% ownership, the second most popular pitcher on FanDuel, only behind Brady Singer. So while I agree with you, I like Freddie Peralta. And, and for cash games, I think you guys should just be playing Strider and Peralta together and then go cheap at hitters if you are playing cash games on DraftKings today. For tournament purposes, yeah, Freddie Peralta is one of my most rostered pitchers, but that means he's in around 25% of my lineups, which is a significantly lesser, lesser portion than what the field has. It's not an issue with Freddie Peralta himself. It's more of an issue with just what his ownership is. And once again, to get back to this the other day, Matt, Another pitcher who's just crazy popular against the Seattle Mariners. I don't know what the Seattle Mariners have done to people where they feel like they just need to jam pitchers 35 to 40% of them every single time. But it, every single slate we look at, it's like there's a pitcher who's projected to be over owned pitching against the Seattle Mariners. I don't know what to attribute it to, but it's happening every single slate now. They're not good, but I'm with you. They're not like Oakland or the White Sox or the Rockies. I'm also surprised at Peralta's ownership. And ultimately, that's what will keep me off him. But I like him. Like, if you just asked me, there was no DK. Like, if I were setting up a, a season-long fantasy lineup and I had all these pitchers to choose from, he'd be right at the top of the list mm -hmm. below Strider, you know? Yeah, and uh, once again, I'm not going to say he's a bad option. I'm going to play him. He's going to win my most rostered starting pitchers. Not nearly 
what the field is doing with them at 36 percent and uh, I agree with you as well just considering what we have as the ownership here on Logan Gilbert you get Logan Gilbert at five percent ownership and we're also to, to bring up something that we've talked about a good amount on the show as well for FanDuel purposes if you play Logan Gilbert instead of playing Freddie Peralta and the Mariners end up winning the game, you're getting yourself a good amount of leverage on the field if Logan Gilbert is getting that win bonus as opposed to Freddie Peralta because Logan Gilbert is projected for 8% ownership on FanDuel, Peralta 24%. So three times more popular on FanDuel is Freddie Peralta than Logan Gilbert on DraftKings. He is seven times more popular. So I agree with you. Relative to the ownership, a 5% on Logan Gilbert, yeah, I want to be overweight to that mark. If we look into the 8K range of pitchers now, a guy that we should start by talking about here is Brady Singer. Brady Singer at $8,700 is projected for 24% ownership on DraftKings. On FanDuel, where he's $9,200, he is 34% on. So another very popular pitcher in Brady Singer. Going up against a White Sox offense, there's a lot of strikeouts in the lineup. It's a very thin lineup as well, where there are hitters like Luis Robert in the middle of it, but you get to the tail end. It is just nothing but shit replacement level hitters. So Brady Singer who is not nearly as talented as some of these other pitchers we have on the slate, but he draws a great matchup and is a little bit cheaper than some of these other guys. What are you doing with Brady Singer at his ownership? Because this is somebody who the field is really getting to a lot. Yeah, I feel similar about him as I do Peralta. Like, I do like him a lot here. Big buying signs in his first start. He was dominant against Minnesota. Not like I'm completely buying that, but still good to see. And then he's facing this White Sox offense. That said, he's just overowned. Yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of ownership going to Brady Singer, and like I said, thir- the thirty four percent Fanduel mark is a massive issue to me because thirty four percent on Fanduel are only rostering one pitcher. Like, how do we get to a point where Brady Singer is four times as popular as Spencer Strider on Fanduel today? And then for DK purposes, the twenty four percent that is a little bit easier to stomach, but still a little bit too high for my liking. I have. Let's see. Singer. Yeah, I've got Singer in just under 10% of my lineups right now. So not not an unplayable pitcher, but another guy. I'm well underweight to the field, too. So some stands that I'm taking with popular pitchers. Another one here, Brady Singer, that I'm going to be underweight to. And usually for cash games on FanDuel, I'll tell you guys to just kind of align yourselves with the field if there's going to be a popular pitcher. But I don't know that I could advocate for Brady Singer being the guy that I want to play in a FanDuel cash game. I would still want to go to Spencer Strider, even though he isn't projected to be quite as popular. Uh, But how do you feel about Spencer, uh, not Spencer Strider, uh, Brady Singer in cash games on FanDuel, considering his ownership and while also weighing that he's probably not the best pitcher, even close to being in the conversation of being like the third best pitcher on the slate? I don't really get it. Like... He looks good to me here. And ultimately, if you were like a thousand dollars cheaper, I would be like, just play him and move on. But he's still expensive on both sides. So for DraftKings, like if you're playing him, you're not playing one of like Peralta, Gilbert. They're in the same price range. Yeah. It's the same thing as Fandle, too. Um, give me the better pitchers at lower ownership despite the matchup. Yeah. And then once again, even for cash games where I usually just want to do what the field is doing to some extent, not how I feel on this particular slate because I I am just not seeing Brady Singer the same way as the field. So on FanDuel, I still think you guys should be playing Spencer Strider for playing cash games. Just lock in that K upside in that K floor. Uh, So outside of Brady Singer, is there another 8K pitcher that you're liking more than him then? We do have Cutter Crawford at $8,400. We've got Hunter Green at $8,300 got hunter brown at 8k of those pitchers hunter green is picking up some ownership 23 percent. the other guys though all single digit owned so in this 8k range if you were trying to get away from brady singer is there somebody else you prefer that's priced comparably not really i think everyone in this range is like overpriced for this slate so no it's gonna be hunter green for me this this mets team appears to be not good, very bad, terrible, awful. And on top of that, Hunter Green, the strikeout upside that he brings to the table, because we've always seen Hunter Green as a guy who, even when he struggled at the big league level, when he first got called up, he was always generating strikeouts. He was always getting those swing and misses. There was massive strikeout upside with Hunter Green. Now he's drawing a Mets lineup. You got like a couple difficult bats in there. You got to deal with Francisco Lindor. You got to deal with Pete Alonzo. 
Jeff McNeil, also good contact hitter, but this is not a very good Mets offense or defense or pitching staff for that matter. And if you look at Hunter Green last year, once again, 4.82 ERA, that was not the best metric in the world, but he did have a 3.82 expected ERA and the strikeout rate north of 30%. 30.9% K rate in his first year in the big leagues, 30.5% K rate his second year in the big leagues. We only seen him make one start so far this year, but he did have a strikeout rate in that start north of 30%. It's only a you know one game, five inning sample size. So we're not looking at all that much, but there, there is no reason to think Hunter Green should fall behind a 30% K rate. He should be right around that mark again this year. Considering the matchup against the New York Mets and his price point, he's my favorite pitcher to roster in this price range. I have him in a significant portion of my lineups. He is actually my uh, second most rostered pitcher right now behind Spencer Strider, Matt. The other thing about that, which I'm surprised you didn't mention, the Mets are the highest on stack on the board, like right with Houston. Yeah. Another thing too, you are getting leverage there because the Mets are crazy popular. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The highest owned stack on the board. So a ton of leverage. And that's also, uh, we got our Cafelza in the chat saying, LOL, Greg, I'm stacking the Mets. Yeah, you're not alone. The, the field is very heavily. We have the Mets projected for 12.5% ownership on the slate. So that simultaneously has them as the most popular offense while also being one of the most over-owned offenses on the slate if we look at the FanDuel side of things for the Mets ownership and also somebody else brought it up in the chat FanDuel has uh, Hunter Green crazy crazy expensive he's very difficult to get to as a pitcher on FanDuel so wouldn't advocate for him uh, there but the Mets uh, still 9% owned on FanDuel not quite as popular as they are on DraftKings but still picking up some ownership and I don't really get it like I, I do understand that Hunter Green when he does struggle that there's going to be home run upside against him but this level of ownership for the Mets, I can't believe against Hunter Green, they're the most popular offense on the slate. So uh, the Mets offense, let's see, what is my stack exposure? It comes down to their prices because there's expensive pitching on the slate. Like that's yeah. why. Yeah. I'm a little bit underweight to the Mets, but they are landing in some lineups for me as well. So it is one where I'm going to be playing some of the Mets. My preferred side is Hunter Green. I'm getting more exposure to Hunter Green than I will to the Mets offense. That makes sense. I mean, when I first looked at this slate, the Mets offense definitely stood out to me in terms of their price tags and how easy it was to get them with really good pitchers. But we'll talk about another pitcher I like in a minute. Yeah, and uh, also going into the chat, Josh Blonde said, why is Hunter Green 10300 on FanDuel? Because of his strikeout upside. Now, to be clear, I don't think 10300 is the right price point for him. I don't really think 8400 on DraftKings is the right price point for him either. It's very rare you'll see pitchers that have like a $2,000 salary gap between the two sites. But the way I look at it, I think Hunter Green's a little bit too expensive on FanDuel and probably a little bit underpriced on DraftKings. So uh, Mets stacks, which the field really seems to be getting to, is uh, one that definitely has some merits to it, but I do prefer the Hunter Green side. And also, I'll check uh, Discord to see if you guys have any questions for us in there. Don't forget that if you guys are a stochastic sub, at any single point during the show or after shows or before shows, you can hit me up in Discord and we'll answer any questions that we have. And the first question we have here is from Hey, I'm Drew. Hey, I'm Drew says, do we trust Strider for cash against an Arizona team with the wind blowing out? Yeah, absolutely. Because even if Spencer Strider gives up a couple of runs, he's almost always going to be a guy that has 8, 9, 10, 11 strikeouts, and that's going to really add insecurity, right? For a cash game, you're looking for floor. Spencer Strider could give up runs, but he always is going to produce strikeouts. You you are very rarely going to have a Spencer Strider outing where he just doesn't strike anybody out. So, yeah, still like him for cash games. I think you were on the same page. Is that correct, Matt? 100%. All right. Uh, BBC, GC in mouth 8, our uh, friend here, has come in to ask us, and words carefully chosen there when I say he's going to come in uh BBC GC and mouth he wants to know who is the cream pie and pull out pitcher and then wants to know who the uh, BBC stack of the day is so let's hit on all of these right here first who is who is the nut pitcher on the slate that you just cannot go without this is just getting weirder and weirder every day I love it <laughs> um I mean the answer to there has got to be Strider like if yeah. there's one guy that you might absolutely need tonight it's more than likely Strider I'm going to say Strider Strider is the nut. Strider is the nut pitcher. As far as the pitcher that we're trying to be underweight to, not like a full-out fade, but as far as what we are considering the pull-out pitcher, the guy I'm going to be underweight to, 
It's just because of what the ownership is, but Freddie Peralta. For me, I'm going to also play the ownership game, but Griffin Canning, like he's cheap. So I get it, but that's it. He's cheap. So for me, it's Griffin Canning. And then uh, we'll get to the other part of your question where he wants to know what is the uh, BBC stack of the day? So we'll figure out later when we get into stacks who it's going to take some balls to roster today. But uh, first, we're going to uh, finish talking about pitching here. And hey, listen, Kobe and Chad saying it's not funny anymore. What can you do? The guys are paying customers. He's asking me questions. I have to answer them. People leave super chats. I'm going to answer them. People ask us questions in Discord. Going to answer them. It's one of the perks they get from signing <laughs> up here. And if you guys want to sign up, use the link below. Sign up for our lineup generator package. You can sign up for our Sims package. You can sign up for our data package. And it also is going to get you access to Discord. And the MLB lineup generator, I, I think the lineup generator is great for basketball. But for baseball, I find it to be even more valuable just when you consider how complex MLB lineups are, the different potential stacking options. You could build lineups with all different stack types, and it is going to be able to isolate lineups that are projected to be plus EV for us. But then also it gives you data like our projected ownerships as well as our player projections. So if you want to edit some of those lineups, maybe change some of the players to uh, maybe get to a different player who is projected comparably, you could do that as well. So uh, sign up for that package if you're looking for it. It is the most cost-effective package that we have for baseball and also does grant you access to our Discord channel. Uh, punt pitchers, Matt, are there any cheap pitchers that you're liking on this slate? We could group all of them together. Uh, the only one that's popular is Griffin Canning. You mentioned that. Canning is projected for 29% ownership. The other cheap options we have, Eric Fetty, Cody Bradford, Jose Quintana, Tommy Henry, Patrick Corbin. Those guys are all projected for ownership 5% and less. So if you had to pick one pitcher to punt with today, would you go with Griffin Canning, or are you looking at maybe one of these lower-owned guys? I got a lower-owned guy that I like. I mean, like is relative, but I like at his ownership. Eric Fetty, 7,200. Matchup against Kansas City, which I'm not scared of. I know that he was like an also-ran for the Nationals, but was the KBO MVP last year. He looked good in his first start against Detroit. I'll go back there. At low ownership, while Griffin Canning is chalky, give me Eric Fetty. Yeah, so as far as Griffin Canning, uh, he's very popular. I'm actually not all that much different than the field on him, unfortunately. I would like to be underweight, but just looking at the data, looking at my sims, the problem that I have with getting away from Griffin Canning is I dislike these other cheap pitchers so much that if I have to go cheap with somebody – it's I'm just going to go with Griffin Canning as being the best overall pitcher that we have from a talent standpoint here. Uh, when we talk about stacks, I think there's a really good case to be made to get to Boston for leverage as well. I'm not going to be quite as high as the field on that 29% mark that Griffin Canning is, but he is the cheap pitcher I'm landing on the most as far as exposure, just because the other options, once again, it's Eric Fetty. No, thanks. He sucks. Cody Bradford, very difficult match against Houston Astros. Also probably isn't going to work particularly deep into the game. Jose Quintana in a super, super pitcher-friendly park on the road in Cincinnati. Tommy Henry pitching against the Atlanta Braves. That's a disaster. And you got Patrick Corbin. He sucks, and he's pitching against the Philadelphia Phillies. So kind of by process of elimination, I, I feel like I'm kind of forced to tell you guys that, like, yeah, if you're rostering a pitcher around 7K, Griffin Canning is that guy, but I am going to be a little bit underweight to him. I get that. I mean, it makes sense because he is really cheap. I'll say this, though, like mm – -hmm. And I'll go back to Joe Boyle the other day. Why are cheap pitchers getting a lot of ownership against Boston? Like it's some really good matchup. Like I don't think Canning's a bad pitcher, but this is a brutal matchup that I don't think people are accounting for. So this one, I understand more than the Joe Boyle. The Joe Boyle one was confusing to me because there was other options. I could understand the Griffin Canning ownership today just because the other options are so shitty that it's just like, I'm going to play Griffin Canning because he's so much better than these other cheap pitchers. That was not what Joe Boyle was. Joe Boyle was a guy who did not appear to be a good pitcher, and there was other comparable options there. I'm trying to remember, do, who, who was the cheap pitcher we liked instead of Boyle on that slate that came through? Do you recall? Was, was that something. the Blanco slate? That's correct, yeah. So Ronel Blanco had a big game that day. So there, there was other good pitchers to roster for cheap. Today... I just don't like these other guys. So I get why the field is getting there. It's still a little bit higher for me. The way that I really would prefer to go about my pitching options is to pay up today. If I had to go cheap, I'll go to Griffin Canning. 
But uh, still, I, I think the guy that you really want to be building your lineups around is going to be Spencer Schrider on the high end. Any of these other cheap pitchers do you want to talk about? No, I like Fetty here. I think okay. that a big question, and that was the guy I just talked about before. So again, Fetty was the KBO MVP last year. Like, again, not saying that he's going to carry that over and be dominant in MLB this year, but he was really good against Detroit in his first start. So nice strikeout upside. The KBO is a good lead. It's not the MLB. It's like a little bit better than AAA. And he was the MVP. We've seen guys go over to Korea and change things up, a la Merrill Kelly. I like Eric Fetty here. Eric Fetty's numbers last year in KBO, they, they really are strong. A lot of times, too, the KBO kind of suppresses strikeouts. It is a different uh, kind of Correct. game outlook. You see a lot more pitch into contact. You see walks are a lot lower. And uh, I watched KBO for an entire year. Because of the because yeah. uh, of the the COVID years where we had nothing going on in DFS other than KBO at 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, but Eric Fetty in the KBO last year, he had a 2.0 ERA, 2.38 FIP, very good numbers, strikeout rate 29.5 percent, also very good mark. And this is a guy who was never really a strikeout pitcher when he played in the MLB, but I am wondering a little bit. In his first start of the season, we did see a good amount of strikeouts from Fetty. He pitched four and two-thirds yeah. innings. He ended up striking out seven guys in that matchup. So that is something that's worth thinking about, to your point, Matt, is maybe Eric Fetty is just a totally different pitcher now than we've ever seen from him in the past. And I, I think you're talking me into him a little bit more, where I, I'm going to go into the Sims now, and I'm going to give an ROI boost to Eric Fetty, just because I think that there's a case to be made. Not that we know it for sure, but there's a possibility this is a different pitcher than he was when he was in the MLB in previous years. And also all your points that you made about Griffin Canning still apply. Well, every time, everything you were saying about all the other pitchers are garbage and you don't want to roster them made me only, only like Fetty more because I think he's like that guy and he's not getting any ownership. So there's obviously risk here. We don't know what he is, but I think there's upside and no one's getting there. So I'm intrigued. Yeah, Eric Fetty, for a reference, is projected for 5% ownership. And then also, it's a matchup against the Kansas City Royals. It's not like this is the most difficult matchup on the slate. And to what you had said before about Griffin Canning, I do think Griffin Canning pitching against the Red Sox is a more difficult matchup than Fetty pitching against the Royals. Same. I don't even think it's close. Like, good ballpark for Fetty. I don't get the Canning ownership. Like, I get it in the sense that you're talking about. The cheap options are not good. He's like the only quote unquote good pitcher of the group. I just think Fetty looks a lot better. Now I'm buying the hype a little bit. I watched that first start. He was really good against Detroit. So I could be completely off here and look like a doofus tomorrow, but that's MLB DFS. Any other punts that you're considering? Cause uh, once again, the names are uh, not, not the highest of name value. No, I think the big question of this slate though, as we pivot to stacks is, as much of a priority as Strider is, mm -hmm. is he more of a priority than the Braves stacks? Because the Braves are also really expensive. Yeah, so the way that I am going to be looking at this uh, slate is twofold. First off, I'm for a lot of these high-end stacks, I'm going to be playing a lot of players at the tail end of the lineups today. To, to, for a couple of reasons. Number one, guys towards the bottom half of the order, they're much cheaper than the guys at the top of the lineup, and also they typically carry less ownership. So that's going to be a big strategy for me as I'm looking through my exposures is I'm going to be playing back-end order of the guys because I do have a bunch of Braves exposure, but something else too, and this also might be a scenario that's a little different from you considering you play a lot of you know single entry, three max type stuff, but also a lot of my Braves lineups are not going to contain Spencer Strider. My lineups that have Strider are going to be having some of the cheaper stacks. So I'll have some different sorts of builds, but yeah, it is going to be very important for my lineups to be playing cheap hitters at the end of the lineup that don't have as much ownership. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Let's see if there was any other questions that came in here. And uh, no, looks like we are uh, good and all caught up here. Nicholas Robertson in the chat did say that Patrick Corbin might be the worst pitcher in baseball. I don't know I'd go that far, but he's uh, he's certainly not good at all. Yeah, he's not good, but he's not the worst pitcher in baseball. Who who would you consider? I'm going to pull up some numbers from last year. Who do you consider to be the worst pitcher in baseball? Is there somebody that comes to mind? 
Jordan Lyles comes to mind. I'm not even sure if he has a spot this year, although I'd put him in the same level as Corbin. Um, mm, I saw Julio Tehran got signed this morning for some reason. (laughs) I don't know. I'm not sure exactly who. Someone for the Rockies. I don't think, first off, I don't think Corbin is any worse than like Kyle Freeland. Freeland's been uh, rough the last couple of years. Yeah. All right, let's see. I'm going to see which pitchers had the lowest wins above replacement last year. Let's see. All right, there were some bad, there were some very terrible pitchers last year. Jorge Lopez pitched on three different teams. Three different teams gave this guy a chance last year. He had a 5.95 ERA, 5.41 FIP. Uh, Eric Lauer was terrible last year. I, I'm not sure what his health status is this year, but Eric Lauer had a 6.56 ERA, 7.54 expected ERA. Were some other bad ones. Yeah, there was a bunch of really terrible pitchers. Chad Cool has been terrible for a while. He had an 8.45 ERA and an 8.79 expected ERA last year. See, there was a lot of pitchers who, even only making like a handful of starts, still ended up being worth like negative one wins above replacement because of how terrible some of those handful of starts were. But my money, Jose Urania. Because for some oh, yeah. reason, teams always give this guy chances. I forgot about it, it was him. Like Matt, this was Matt Harvey for a really long time. Although Matt Harvey's at least good at one point, so you can kind of understand where teams are like, maybe we could recreate Matt Harvey. Though By the time the eighth team was taking a chance on Matt Harvey, he's like, hey, it, 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 this isn't going anywhere. But Jose Urania continues to get additional chances by teams, and he is terrible. If he pitches in Colorado like he did last year, gets lit up. He's on the Rangers this year. It's probably going to go poorly. Uh, and then uh, even when he pitched in Miami, which is a very pitcher-friendly ballpark, that also was kind of a disaster for him. But uh, yeah, Jose Urania last year, 6.45 ERA, 5.77 expected ERA, negative 0.5 wins above replacement. I'm going to make him my vote for worst pitcher in baseball. I agree with that vote. I forgot about him. And the reason why I'm going to back that up is there's very few pitchers. I can only think of a couple. Matt Harvey, as you mentioned, Urania is one of them. I don't care about ownership or anything with the stack going against them. I'm stacking against them. Uh, also, kind of a, a betting-related piece right here I'm going to uh, bring up. I, I do have a bet that I'm about to place here. Comeback player of the year in the National League, O'Neill Cruz. I, I, I know that we also have Edwin Diaz coming back from the torn ACL, the knee injury. You know what I think is going to hurt his counting stats this year? The, the Mets are going to win so few games, it's going to be really hard for him to rack up a lot of saves. O'Neill Cruz appears to be on an absolute, he just hit another home run. He appears to be on an absolute tear to open up the season. He played really well in spring training. He was one of the top prospects in baseball a couple of years ago. What hurt him last year was just, he got injured. He broke his leg. So I like O'Neill Cruz for comeback player of the year. So just wanted to throw that out here before we have moved on past pitchers. But anything else you want to talk about as far as the pitching goes before we talk about stacks? No, I love that call though. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about the stacking side of things and i'm just going to refresh ownership to make sure it hasn't changed since we started the show and we did get an update from seven minutes ago so some of the offensive ownerships look a little bit different now it's like the mets are now the second most popular offense on the slate whereas they were the most popular before three teams picking up significant ownership on DraftKings. matt the houston astros the new york mets the kansas city royals all three of them projected for double digit ownership of those three teams that have double-digit ownership, do you think any of them are chalk options that you do want to be getting to? Yeah, Houston for sure. I mean, they're the top stack on the board. Ownership is there, but not where it should be. 15% chance of being the top stack, 12% ownership. And I'm sure a lot of that ownership is concentrated on the top of the lineup. So plenty of ways to get different here. Like, I'd imagine, and I'm going to pull it up right now, that, like, Yainar Diaz, Yainar Diaz is pulling a ton of ownership, and so are a couple other guys, whereas the full stack might not be crazy high-owned. So, yeah, I like Houston a lot here. How about you? Yeah, Houston is actually the stack I have the most exposure to right now, which is not really all that surprising. If you guys are looking at the top stacks tool and you're running sims using our simulation tool, there's always going to be a lot of synchronicity between the two because our top stacks tool is also based on simulations. We've been running simulations on the site in some form or fashion 
for many years now. So the top stack still has always been built on simulations and simulating out which teams are expected to be the highest scoring relative to the ownership. And when we have a team in here, even though they are expected to be popular, it's not nearly popular enough. It's not that often that the highest owned projected team on the slate has significantly higher top stack odds than what their ownership is. And that's a scenario with the Houston Astros. And yeah, there are some individual hitters like Jose Altuve, like Yanir Diaz, to your point, that are expected to be picking up some ownership here. But it's not anything crazy. It's not like these guys are like 15, 16% owned. They're they're still owned in like the low teens. Yeah, like they're not close to like NBA ownership. I mean, the most popular hitter, Yanir Diaz, 16.5% ownership. The other thing I like here is like their best hitters outside of Altuve. I know Diaz has been great, but like Alvarez, Tucker, Bregman, all 10% or under. Yeah. So uh, Houston Astros team that I definitely do like getting to. It is currently my favorite stack on the slate. And then there are players that I'm liking getting to at the end of the order. So I don't know. Did we get, did we get the Astros official lineup yet, by the way? I'm not sure. Let's see if that came out. I didn't see it, but it could have come out while we were on the show. Uh, it did. came out just as we were starting. So we've got this lineup. It is Altuve, Jordan Alvarez, Tucker, Bregman, Yanir Diaz, Chaz McCormick, Abreu, Pena, and then uh, Myers at the end. So a couple of lower own pieces that I am getting double-digit exposure to. Uh, Jake Myers, as well as Chaz McCormick, two outfield spots where that is a very sensible way to save salary and also not be picking up a ton of ownership. And that gives you the salary savings to still be able to pay up for guys like Jordan Alvarez, like Jose Altuve, like Alex Bregman. So uh, those are a couple of the end of the order bats that are standing out to me. Uh, in your Astro stacks, are you more committed to the top of the order guys, or are you willing to get to a one or two of some of these cheap guys as well? Definitely willing to get to the bottom of the lineup of so any lineup I stack basically ever. So Houston's certainly no different. I will say, I don't like that McCormick is the highest owned outfielder here, like over Alvarez and Tucker. It's a price thing, and I get it. Like Alvarez and Tucker are expensive, but that just makes me want to get to those guys more. And uh, Malukar asked a question in chat: Is anybody getting to Cutter Crawford today? No, I don't really think he's somebody I'm going to be playing very much. Uh, do you have much interest in Cutter Crawford, Matt? No, I don't like the price point. Coming in with nice leverage. Don't hate the pivot off of Singer for him, but probably not. I like Fetty more at the at, you know good amount cheaper. Yeah. That's how I feel as well. Just other pitchers I prefer for cheaper. And if I'm going to be like, if Cutter, Craw Cutter Crawford really should be priced in like that high 6K range, then it'd be a different scenario, but he's not. He's really expensive. So uh, we've got Nicholas Robertson in the chat saying, the Mets suck ass. How are they a top stack? Yeah, the reason they are is because they are cheap. They have home run equity and there's a lot of expensive pitching on the slate. So I kind of understand why the field is getting there. I just don't want as much exposure to the Mets as the field has in lineups where it's like Strider and Peralta. Like, yeah, I could see where the Mets fit into lineups. The problem with that is that's going to be a super popular lineup build. I, that actually, I think, is going to be probably the most commonly rostered combination on the entire slate. Mets stack, Strider, and, and Freddie Peralta at pitcher. I think that's going to be the most popular lineup combination. I agree, but I will say, like, kind of like the Astros, and I get it. Like Houston has a much higher top stack percentage, so they look a lot better in tournaments. But the ownership is about the same. So it's not like the Mets are going to be worrisome owned if you get different elsewhere. Like I don't want to play the Mets with Peralta and Strider, like you said. But if I'm playing Eric Fetty, you know, maybe I don't get to the Mets, but I don't mind it nearly as much, you know? Where I'd be most apt to want to play the Mets is like with Logan Gilbert. Right, because Gil yeah. well, if you're I, if you're playing the Mets, it's to pay up for pitching. Because if you do like the the Fetty with the Mets lineup, then I think you're getting to a spot where it's like, all right, but what am I what am I spending my money on then? Right, because because Fetty is cheap, the Mets are cheap, so that's that's the guy that I think makes most sense with the Mets is Logan Gilbert for super low ownership at pitcher, and also maybe a little bit of leverage off of Peralta if he gets the win. That's fair. I mean, I kind of viewed like. A Fed, excuse me, a Fetty Gilbert combo, something like that. Let's get back to the question that our guy uh, BBC and uh, BB uh, BBC GC and Mouth Eight asked us in Discord. Who wants to know what is the 
uh, stack that we like the most overall on the slate. We're talking about the uh, the BBC stack, the stack that takes the most balls to play today. So maybe not our, our favorite stack on the slate, but which low owned stack do you have the most interest in? I, I can almost guarantee I know your answer is right here because it's going to be the same as mine. So I wrote them up today. The answer is easy there for me. It checks a lot of boxes. No, because I oh. mine's like mine is Seattle. Um, as far as like that question, because I don't view Boston as like a balls to play them type of stack. Like I view them as just a good stack that's just not getting enough love. I view Seattle as a stack. Like you got to have some cojones to play Seattle, but our tools really like them. Four and a half percent chance of being a top stack, two percent ownership. Wouldn't be the first time Peralta got beat up. Again, not where I'm going. Boston is my favorite stack on the board, ownership considered. But my, okay. you got to have some crazy balls to play them stack is Seattle. Maybe I answered that the wrong way. Yeah, I mean, listen, the, the question we're quibbling. Asked is what is yeah. the BBC stack of the day? I don't <laughs> think there's a right or wrong answer to answer that particular question. But for me, the answer is the Boston Red Sox. They're going up against a pitcher that is insanely popular. If you look at all of the pitchers that are picking up ownership on the slate, Hunter Green, 26% owned, uh, Aaron Nola, 20%, Griffin Canning, 27%, Brady Singer, 25%, Schreier, 30%, Peralta, 36%. I think we've got a couple of things going in our favor here. First, I think Griffin Canning of all those pitchers is likely the worst of the popular pitchers, but then also is still a fairly difficult matchup against the Boston Red Sox and a Boston team that looks like they're going to be running a decent amount this year. We've seen it with, with Duran. We saw a game where he had three stolen bases. That adds a little bit of upside. Usually we're looking for power, but stolen bases, that's another way that you can find upside in hitters here. So uh, Boston Red Sox in a, a hitter-friendly ballpark in Los Angeles, going up against the pitchers, project for a ton of ownership. We only have, let's see, one, two, three. There's only five offenses on the entire slate that is sub-5% ownership. It is Washington, it is Boston, it is the White Sox, it's the Diamondbacks, and it's Seattle. Of those ones, it is pretty clear to me that the Red Sox are the low-owned offense I want to be getting to. Yeah, same. I don't get it, like, why they're so low-owned, but they're my favorite stack on the board, too. I just... Seattle is the same thing, only much less likely to succeed than Boston because while both Canning and Peralta are getting love, Peralta is obviously a much better pitcher. Now we've got a question from Mr. Coolcam. First, he wants to know uh, our favorite pitcher and favorite contrarian stack for a FanDuel GPP. So favorite pitcher, pretty easy for me on FanDuel to answer Spencer Strider at sub 10% ownership. So Strider is my favorite contrarian pitcher on FanDuel. As far as favorite contrarian stack, let's see what the updated ownership is on the FanDuel side of things. I think it's basically the same answer, Boston. So the reason it isn't Boston for me on FanDuel The canning ownership. First, Boston's more popular, but second, Griffin Canning doesn't have ownership on FanDuel. So you're not getting leverage. The main reason that I like the Boston Red Sox on DraftKings is you're getting them at a nearly 30% on Griffin Canning you're going up against. Totally different scenario where Canning's only 1% owned on FanDuel. So with that in mind, hmm, low-owned stack. Maybe this is where it takes the balls to play the Seattle Mariners. I mean, it takes balls on both sites, but I get the Mariners at 1% ownership on FanDuel. Don't know that that's my answer, though. Favorite? You know what? The Chicago White Sox on FanDuel. Brady Singer's 33.5% owned on a single pitcher site. That's insane to me. It's so much ownership to Brady Singer. We can only roster one pitcher on FanDuel. He's, he's not even that cheap. He's $9,200. He's priced over 9 k on FanDuel and still picking up all that ownership. Listen, this White Sox offense is not going to be particularly good this year, but if you could just get them to put up four or five runs on Brady Singer and you get Brady Singer out of the game early, you could be killing off a third of the field there. So my favorite contrarian stack on FanDuel, Brady Singer is my least favorite pitcher on FanDuel relative to his ownership and price. So I might as well like the White Sox offense because the ownership is so much different on FanDuel than DK tonight. Yeah, I'm with you. And that that point makes sense about Boston and, and you know Canning doesn't have the ownership on FanDuel. The only thing I'll say is like, yeah, that's a feather in their cap for why they, I like them on DraftKings. But I just like them in general. Like the top, stool, top stack tool says that they are one of, if not the best tournament stack on the board. 
And I think you could say the same thing on FanDuel. Yeah, so uh, Chicago White Sox. And another thing, too, that makes this really difficult to Mr. Cool Cam's question, there are only a few low-owned offenses on FanDuel. The ownership is uh, way, like, once again, way different looking across the two sites. The low-owned offense you have on FanDuel, it's Texas against Hunter Brown. Not really super keen on that. You got the White Sox against Brady Singer. That kind of became my option there. And then you got Washington against Nola. No thanks. Arizona against Spencer Strider. Also no thanks. Seattle against Freddie Peralta. You can make a case for it, but I do feel a little bit better about the uh, White Sox one, especially when, I mean, Brady Singer is mid 30% ownership, whereas Peralta just over 20% on FanDuel. So let's, let's land on the White Sox there, his favorite contrarian stack. Hey, I'm Drew. 95 wants to know, are the Reds are a team that we're interested in? They're in a good spot at home against the lefty. Cincinnati Reds, Matt, is that a stack that you're liking relative to their ownership tonight? I think they're a middle of the board stack ownership and top stack percentage says that. So I think that Cincinnati is a middling stack. Quintana is a fine pitcher at this point. Not a guy I want to use often. Not a guy I'm going after, like going out of my way to target. So the thing about this slate is there are a bunch of really good pitchers and a bunch of not good pitchers. And then a few in between. Quintana is one of those guys that's in between. So I think Cincinnati's good, good ballpark. They have power upside, but not like my favorite stack on the board. I mean, the field is getting to them in 8% of lineups. I have 7.5% exposure to them right now. I'm just so in line with the field that it's it's not a team that I would say is, uh, it's not a team I'm like disinterested in. It's just a very neutral stack, which is kind of what you were getting at as well. If I'm playing single entry, which I, I don't know if that's exactly with, uh, hey, I'm Drew might be asking about. It's not a team I would consider in single entry. I do think that, you know, you talked about and you mentioned the three stacks that are getting double digit ownership. I think it's probably pertinent that we talk about the two teams like getting right below that, the Braves and Phillies. Yeah, I can't so believe this Atlanta, Atlanta ownership. Yeah, the Atlanta Braves have the second highest top stack odds on the slate. We've got them at 15.5%. They're coming in just below the Houston Astros. So with our most updated projections here, guys, we have two teams that have double-digit top stack odds. The Astros, 16.3% chance to be the highest-scoring stack on the slate with 10.9% projected ownership. And the Atlanta Braves, a 15.5% chance to be the top-scoring stack on the slate with 9.6% projected ownership going to them. So you have the Atlanta Braves, the Houston Astros, both offenses that I certainly like getting to. I'm overweight to them. It's just going to be hard to get them into build with like Spencer Strider. This is where somebody like Eric Fetty comes into play or maybe Griffin Canning because you're going to need that salary savings to be able to get these offenses in because even the end of the Braves lineup is not all that cheap. That's why the Braves are a team that have a 4.6% chance of being the top value stack on slate compared to 9.3% for the Houston Astros. So all things being considered, I do prefer Houston to Atlanta. I like Atlanta. I'm going to be overweight to them. But if somebody was just looking to roster one payoff offense, I'm going to tell you the Houston Astros. But yeah, I think the Braves look like another fairly under owned team that should be picking up more ownership. So because of what you said about how much easier it is to get Houston, I think in like the single entry, three entry max stuff, Houston's going to be not a lot higher than Atlanta, but higher than Atlanta. And again, that's just like guesstimating on my part. But I feel like I've got a very good read on these things. And I think Houston will be slightly higher owned than Atlanta. And at the end of the day, like the bottom of Atlanta's, Atlanta's lineup is expensive, but it's also really good. Like, so I really like Atlanta here. I'm not sure I'll be able to put that into action because they're really expensive, but I like them a ton here. I mean, what's not to like? Yeah. And uh, we did get a question from Mod Dub T in the chat. He said, hey guys, late to the party. Any love for Eric Fetty? Yeah, Matt talked me on to Eric Fetty a little bit at the top of the show. He's somebody who wasn't really making his way into many of my lineups. And then Matt made some good cases for him. And I was like, yeah, when I'm rebuilding my lineups after the show here, I'm going to be doing an ROI boost to Eric Fetty. But uh, Matt, answering the question from a fellow Matt and Mod Dub T, which you and I, because we're so cool, we're able to figure out what that meant after about a year and a half. <laughs> uh, what is it about Eric Fetty that you like? You don't have to go super in depth because we already talked about it, but just for Mod Dub T since he asked in Discord. So again, he was a uh, nothing with the Nationals when he first came up, but he spent last season in Korea and wasn't just like good, was the KBO MVP with really good numbers. Strikeout stuff was up. Strikeout stuff looked good in spring training. He was really good against Detroit in his first start. He's cheap. 
not getting any ownership. Yeah, uh, laid it out pretty well there. And it, it's not to say that we're confident that Eric Fetty is going to be a good pitcher this year, but there's a very real chance that he is a better pitcher than he was before. And the field is just kind of treating him as if there's no way that he's a good pitcher right now. It is right. ownership and also a decent matchup against the Kansas City Royals. So, yep, we're liking Eric Fetty as a contrarian play. And then Braden in the Discord channel says that he's new to MLB DFS. He wants to know when you sh- when you stack, should you only go in order of the lineup I play where you can only have four of a stack? I'm not sure if you can pick any four from line. Yeah, you, you don't need it to be like the two, three, four, five hitters or anything like that. It's any hitter in the lineup is going to be correlated to another hitter in the lineup. And then also think about it this way. Like if you're playing the nine hitter and the one hitter, I mean, they are still batting technically, you know, next to each other in the order. But no, I don't really typically consider where guys are batting too much when I'm building lineups. Uh, You know, I'm not generally building a stack that's the five, six, seven, eight, nine hitters or something like that, just because those are generally the worst hitters. Like I'm going to be prioritizing the top hitters in lineups when I can, just because those are the better hitters. But in terms of the order of the hitters and where they are in the lineup, it's not like a massive concern for me. Is it for you, Matt? No, especially the more players you use, the more just they all correlate. As far as the wraparound stack goes, I use that a lot. Like eight, nine, one, two, three, six, seven, eight, nine, one. Like I'll definitely get weird with my stacks depending on price tags and popularity of the team I want to stack. And no to answer the question, but the closer they are together, the more they correlate. So like if you're stacking three guys, I wouldn't use like, two, six, and nine. Like, that just doesn't doesn't mean it can't happen. Just that doesn't correlate as well, you know? Yeah, it's something I, I generally don't really consider all that much. It also is, it is taken into account in the Sims when yeah, the, of the games are being played out and simmed on like a batter-by-batter batter basis where it it is going to take all that into account. But no, it's not something I really put all that much thought into. Uh, our guy, uh, BBC, uh, has follow-up question here. And, I don't really understand this one because he's asking us, would we bet the Nats at plus 750 today? Uh, yeah, the problem is that that's not what their price is. Any baseball game ever, if I see a price like that, I'd bet it. But yeah, I mean. they're, The only scenario I'm not betting a plus 750 is if it's like the Yankees are playing against a college team. The college team is yeah. plus 750. Right. But there's so much variance in baseball, you're almost never going to see Super significant favorite. So I'll read off the games for today. Uh, the Reds are favored over the Mets. They're minus 122. The Phillies are favored over the Nationals. They're minus 190. So the Nationals there are plus 160. And he had asked us, would we bet the Nationals at plus 750? Yeah, the, the problem is that they're plus 160. So no at plus 160. I'm trying to think. Maybe he's betting an offline. Or maybe I, mean, I should just consider that a guy whose name is BBC in mouth eight is not a is not an honest broker with real questions for us every time. That's another. Thing I think it's the latter. I think it is the latter. Are there any other uh, stacks that are going to be important to you in your lineups for today? We've only got a few minutes left here, so I want to make sure that we uh, touch on any other stacks that are important to you before we head out and out here because we also got our home run picks to do. So one that we didn't really touch on that much that I think is intriguing is Philly. They don't look as good as Houston and Atlanta in the top stack tool. And I respect Corbin probably more than the masses, but this is also a guy that gives up a lot of power. Philly has a lot of power and they will get squeezed out by Atlanta and Houston on a lot of slates. Philly against Corbin would be the most popular team on the slate today. They won't be just because of Houston and Atlanta. So that's intriguing to me, you know, Probably not much more than intriguing, but it's intriguing. The problem with me is mainly the price point because we got them as, you know, 9.6% owned, 9.6% chance to be a top stack. But we do have them with the, what, the third or fourth lowest odds be the top value stack on the slate. So just the prices are really baked into them facing Patrick Corbin. But I hear what you're saying. Basically, any other time Patrick Corbin starts, the offense going up against him is crazy popular. That's happened basically every single Corbin start the last year and a half. And yeah, there is still ownership going to the Phillies, but it's not like they're the most popular offense on the slate, which is typically the case with Patrick Corbin starts. But yeah, the price- And when we're looking at this- get to them. Yeah, for sure. But when we're looking at this also, I think it's important to bring up, and you talk about this a lot, in multi-entry stuff, like these ownerships are going to be more online than in like 
the higher dollar, smaller field stuff where they might get squeezed out more, which in turn would make them more appealing. Now I'm just hypothesizing at this point, and I'm not going to play them because of that, but I won't be surprised if they get really squeezed out in those higher end contests. All right, guys, let's do it before we finish up here. And also, if you haven't done yet, like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. We're about to be doing some uh, dong picks here. And then after that, I'm going to let you guys know about a deal that's going on at DraftKings for pick six. So before we get there and before I tell you guys about the DraftKings offer, Matt, who's your dong pick? Who's hit, who's going yard today? I'm going to go Rafael Devers. Um, I want to get on the board here, so I'm going Devers. Let me look at my hitter exposures. Always tricky, right? Because we're trying to con we're trying to combine uh, something who it's like, all right, who's somebody who's realistic at a home run, but isn't you know we don't want to pick guys who are at court. Not that there's a course field game today. We don't want it to be too obvious of a choice. Yeah, I'm worried Devers was too obvious. No, no. I mean, I'm going to go with Austin Riley here. He is projected for single digit ownership. Austin Riley, so big power upside in the Atlanta Braves offense as per usual. But yeah, give me Austin Riley at single-digit projected ownership as a guy to go yard today. So Austin Riley of the Atlanta Braves. And also want to let you guys know that if you are checking out DraftKings Pick 6 and you're a new customer over there, you get up to $200 in Pick 6 credits when you sign up for the first time. And then also, you get your first card refunded there if it doesn't win. So go check out Pick 6. It's something that Eric's been doing a lot of content for in the Discord channel. And Highly recommend that you guys check some of that stuff out. Pick six looks like it could be a massive disruptor in the way that people play fantasy sports and also play player props. Really fun way to be able to play in a tournament sort of setting while also being able to uh, look at it from a standpoint of, hey, you're taking different props. Instead of competing against the house, you're competing against other people, which I find to be really fun. Like I, I do like the strategy of playing DFS more than just straight up sports betting because there are other things to consider when it's like, what is the field going to be doing? There's ownership to consider. So uh, pick six, something that I am hoping is going to be growing in popularity very soon. Uh, if you guys haven't done yet, like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. NBA Live Before Lock is coming up next. Any final thoughts here, Matt? No, it should be a fun slate. So excited to see how this one plays out. All right, guys. So I will see you back here in about an hour. I'm going to be jumping on to playback with Josh after the NBA slate lock. So uh, stick around for that. See you guys over in playback. If you are heading out here, I hope you guys have a great weekend. So I'll see you all later.